the difference between the early 87 version and the late 87 version, it wasn't much. The, the, the content of it was pretty much the same, except the terminology suddenly has changed. Creation's gone, intelligent design is in. And in fact, here's how they defined creation in the early 1987 version. Creation means that various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of intelligent creator with their distinctive features already intact. Fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings, etc. Here's how the late 1987 version, after creationism gets banned in public schools, defines intelligent design. Intelligent design means that various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency with their distinctive features already intact. Fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings, etc. Game, set and match, folks. Here we have a smoking gun. We have absolute proof that intelligent design and creationism are exactly the same thing. We simply exchange the titles. That is a Perry Mason moment. Needless to say, we went into the case pretty confident. Um, Wesley wrote a program, had a, one that he'd actually written earlier, I think, hadn't um, that search took all of the text of these five versions and sort of mapped them out. And it found that in the uh, early versions of this, you know, creation, creationism, creation science, all those very co various cognates of that word appeared hundreds of times throughout the earlier manuscripts until June of 87, when the Supreme Court says you can't teach creationism, and all of a sudden, gone. There's no more talk of anything to have to do with creationism, and it's all intelligent design, but the content's still the same. So the trial starts on September 26, 2005. I'm sorry, let me, let me skip back. The ID people were pretty confident, too, because they had gotten a conservative Republican judge, uh, Judge Jones. He had been appointed by George uh, W. Bush. Um, here's what one guy had to say on, on Bill Dembski's webpage when that was done. It, appointments on cases are done randomly. You never know who's going to get them. Uh, as soon as they found out Judge Jones, he said, Judge Jones is a good old boy brought up through the conservative ranks, a political buddy of Governor Tom Ridge, who is in deep in George W. Bush's circle of power and was appointed by GW himself. I don't know why he types that way. Senator Rick Santorum is a Pennsylvanian in the same circles. And last but far from least, George W. Bush himself drove a stake in the ground saying, teach the controversy. Unless Judge Jones wants to cut his career off at the knees, he isn't going to rule against the wishes of his political allies. Uh, Bill Dembski himself, actually, before the Dover trial came up, when this was still sort of speculative, made a little bet. I'll wager a bottle of single malt scotch should it ever go to trial, whether ID may legitimately be taught in public school science curricula, that ID will pass all constitutional hurdles. On the third day of the trial, Rob Pennock took the stand as an expert witness. Rob is a uh, philosopher and historian of science at Michigan State, as I said, uh, co-founder of Michigan Citizens for Science. Um, he also, as one local reporter there in the paper said in Dover, uh, he's a serious, serious brainiac. Um, I think that's a compliment. Uh, <laughs> We have missed no opportunity for the last year and a half to sarcastically refer to Rob as Professor Brainiac, uh, who I hear is going to be the villain in the next Spider-Man movie. <laughs> the plaintiff's case went pretty much as expected. There were no big surprises. We, you know, it was very well planned out. We knew everything we needed to say, and they really didn't do much damage to our side in the cross-examination. Uh, the one testy moment came with Barbara Forrest. Uh, who was the one who was using that information. She was the one testifying on the smoking gun that we talked earlier. And they tried like hell to keep her off the witness stand. They made challenge after challenge. It went on all day in court, uh, arguing over whether she's really an expert, whether she really should, is qualified. She's a philosopher. She wrote a book about the intelligent design movement called Creationism's Trojan Horse. Finally, the judge said, enough. She's an expert. Put her on the stand. Uh, but uh, other than that, it went pretty clear. Uh, it was when the defense began to present their case that things started to get interesting. Um, as I said, the, the imbalance between the two teams in terms of legal talent was extraordinary. And this really started to show with how unprepared their witnesses were when they got on the witness stand. Um, that they weren't ready for the lines of questioning that they were getting, and they really got sandbagged a lot. Uh, the first person they put up there was Michael Behe. Uh, and uh, one of the issues that they talked about with him was peer review. One of the main criticisms of the intelligent design movement is they don't publish the way every other scientist publishes, in peer-reviewed journals, which means journals where other scientists review your work before it gets published. And they tend to publish in popular magazines, popular journals, books, you know, for their followers uh, that are not real technical. So they asked me if his 1996 book, Darwin's Black Box, had been peer-reviewed. And he said not only was it peer-reviewed, it went, underwent more stringent peer-review 
than a regular book was because the subject was so controversial. The publishers really made sure that everything was in line with this. Right? And he specifically mentioned a man named Dr. Michael Atchison, who was a veterinary biochemist from the University of Pennsylvania, as one of the men who had reviewed the book. And that name sort of jogged Nick Matsky's memory. He remembered having read an article in a Christian magazine that Atchison had wrote about this, talking about his peer review in the book. And here's how he describes what he did for this book. He said, we spent approximately 10 minutes on the phone. This is with the editor of the book. After hearing a description of the work, I suggested that the editor should seriously consider publishing the manuscript. It sounded like this Behe fellow might have some good ideas, although I could not be certain since I had never seen the manuscript. We hung up, and I never thought about it again. But that's just the start of it. That was only half the story. The book had allegedly been reviewed by uh, five people, of whom we know the identity of four, including Atchison. The other three are Robert Shapiro, John Morrow, and Russell Doolittle. During and after the trial, uh, myself and Skip Evans, who used to be with the National Center for Science Education, started doing a whole investigation. And we contacted these guys, and they sh gave us the reviews that they had written in the book. Um, as it turned out, uh, Morrow and Doolittle had slammed it. Uh, and said it's absolute nonsense. Uh, Shapiro had said, I think it's nonsense, but it's probably the best written explanation of that perspective, so you probably ought to publish it. Apparently, this is what passes for stringent peer review in the world of intelligent design. Behe was also ambushed a bit um, on another issue. One of his standard claims in his books is that evolution has no explanation for, scientists have no explanation for the evolution of the immune system. And so, uh, this was a little bit of theater in the courtroom. Eric Rothschild, doing the cross-examination of him, wheels in a cart full of books about the evolution of the immune system, books and articles. And one by one, he handed them to him. Have you read this book, Professor Behe? Well, no, I haven't. Have you read this book, Professor Behe? Well, no, I haven't. And as he sat in the witness stand, they began piling up on his lap. <laughs> and Behe's not a particularly tall man, and at one point he literally was having to lean around this to see... Eric Rothschild, and at one, at one point, finally, he said, uh, you know, excuse me, Mr. Rothschild, can you, can you take these back? They're starting to get heavy, you know, which was sort of symbolic of, you know, what he really meant to say was, the evidence is weighing me down. I'd really rather not deal with it, you know. Uh, Rothschild's uh, cross-examination was so effective that actually, months later, Judge Jones was still talking about it uh, in an interview. Um, there's all the part of the books that they piled up there, by the way. Um, in an interview later, Judge Jones said, I would say Eric Rothschild's cross-examination of Professor Behe might be as good a cross-examination of an expert witness as I've ever seen. And he said he thought it would continue to be taught in attorney advocacy classes. So pretty good all the way around. The other witness for the defense uh, that offered really weird testimony was Steve Fuller, a sociologist professor of science at the University of Warwick. And what made Fuller really a weird witness was he didn't believe in ID. He didn't think it was true. He said under oath, no, I don't think it's a better explanation than evolution. But here's what he did think, and this is where you get really strange. He thought that what he called radical and innovative ideas should get the benefit of a, quote, affirmative action strategy. And he actually used that phrase. How do you expect any kind of minority view with any promise to get a toehold in science, he asked. And his answer was, you basically need new recruits. And he proposed that ID should be put into public school science classrooms because it would help them recruit future scientists who might be able to develop the idea to the point where it has scientific merit. 